let's take a look at the statement of the problem so this question appeared in jam 2021 the statement is the root mean scale velocity of molecules of oxygen gas is given by b at some temperature t the molecules of another gas have the same rms velocity at temperature t divided by 16 the second gas is so as we know the root mean scale speed is given by this expression v rms this is equal to 3 kbt divided by m where t is the temperature of the gas and m is the mass of one gas molecule so we can uh, write this expression like 3 n a k v t divided by mass of one gas molecule and then multiply by avogadro number n a okay note here n a is the avogadro number okay so we can rewrite this as 3 r t where product of the avogadro number and boltzmann constant when we multiply this number this gives us the gas constant r okay and when we multiply the mass of one gas molecule with avogadro number so this gives a mass of uh, avogadro number of gas molecules okay molecular mass this way okay so that means the root mean scale velocity this is proportional to the temperature square root of temperature divided by molecular mass now as uh, in the statement of the question we are given that at certain temperature t so for oxygen if i label the uh, temperature of the oxygen as to this is equal to t it's given and uh, if the rms of oxygen it's vo okay so for oxygen the molecular mass m because the oxygen this is diatomic gas okay so here the molecular mass will be m a single oxygen atom will contain 8 proton and 8 neutron so in in total 16 nucleons a, ga, uh, a gas molecule an oxygen gas molecule it will have in total 32 nucleon okay so the molecular mass for one mole of oxygen will be 32 gram okay so that mean m here we will take as 32 now for the another gas if i label the temperature of the another gas as t dash it is given to be t divided by 16 okay and let's say the root mean scale speed of another gas this is v dash and if somehow we can find the molecular mass of the another gas then we will be able to figure out which, uh, what kind of gas it is okay so then uh, it's also given that at these two different temperature the rms speed of uh, oxygen molecule this is equal to the rms speed of the another gas molecule so that means v oxygen this is equal to v dash okay so that means what we can do is 3 r for oxygen t divided by m is 32 for oxygen so now we are writing it for oxygen 32 square under root this is equal to 3 r t divided by 16 and then divided by molecular mass for the second gas okay some of the common terms they will cancel with each other t will also cancel with t and then this will gives us this implies m dash is equal to 2 gram okay so that mean a one mole of hydrogen if we take an example of hydrogen so hydrogen a hydrogen has one proton and plus one neutron okay so one mole of hydrogen for one mole of hydrogen the molecular mass will be 2 gram so therefore correct option is a the statement is 
a system undergoes a thermodynamic transformation from state S1 to S2, okay, by a two different paths 1 and 2. So, these two different paths they are shown here from the initial and final equilibrium states they are represented as S1 and S2, okay. So, one can move either through path 1 in between these two equilibrium states or via path 2 uh, between S1 and S2, okay. The heat absorbed and work done along path 1 are 50 joule and 30 joule respectively. If the heat absorbed along path 2 is 30 joule, what is the work done along path 2? Okay. So, let us continue with the uh, first, uh, first path. So, along path 1, okay. So, we are given delta Q1, this is equal to how much? 50 joule. Okay and delta W1, the work done is equal to 30 joule, okay. So, now with this information, we can find out what is the internal energy change along path 1 between S1 and S2, let this is delta U1, okay. By applying the first law of thermodynamics, delta U1, that is equal to delta Q1 minus delta W1 and this is equal to 50 minus 30 that is equal to 20 joule. Okay, so 20 joule is the change in internal energy when one moves from between S1 and S2 along path 1. Okay, now let us take a look at the path 2. So, for path 2, delta Q2 it is given it is 30 joule. Okay. Now, here because the S1 and S2 they are the common equilibrium states, it does not matter whether one follows the path 1 or one follows the path 2. So, here because the internal energy it is it is a perfect differential. So, its value it does not matter it is path independent quantity. Okay. So, we can write here delta U1 this is equal to delta U2 and this is equal to is 20 joule as we obtained in the previous uh, part. So, this is equal to 20 joule. Okay. Now, we have to find out what is delta W2. Okay. So, again apply the first law. So, that is delta first law along the path 2. So, delta U2 is the internal energy change along path 2. This is equal to delta Q2 minus delta W2. So, from here one can immediately find delta W2 equal to delta Q2 minus delta U2 and this is further equal to delta Q2 is how much? It is 30 joule. 30 joule minus delta U2 it is 20 and this is equal to 10 joule. So, therefore, our right option is B here. Let us continue with the next question. The statement is, a gaseous system enclosed in an adiabatic container is in equilibrium at pressure P1 and volume V1. Work is done on the system in a quasi-static manner due to which the pressure and volume change to P2 and V2 respectively in the final equilibrium state. At every instant, the pressure and volume obey the condition PV power gamma is constant. So, that means, the system it obeys the adiabatic condition where gamma is equal to Cp by Cv and C is a constant. If the work done is zero, so it is given that work done is zero, then identify the correct statement. So, what we are given is, we are given a system which is enclosed in an adiabatic container. So, that means, loss to, uh, there is no loss to, uh, loss of energy to the surrounding. So, system is held at constant pressure P1 and volume V1, okay. And then, it undergoes adiabatic process and then, its final pressure and volume become P2 and V2, okay. Undergo adiabatic process, adiabatic process. And it's given that at each instant of time, when it undergoes a uh, quasi-static process, 
this condition PV power gamma is equal to constant, it is satisfied. Okay. And it's also given that the work done is zero. So we know that uh, during a adiabatic process, the work done on n moles of gas, this is equal to nR upon gamma minus 1 multiplied by P1 B1 minus P2 B2. Okay. Because it's given that the work done is zero. Okay. So that means we have to equate this quantity to be equal to zero. Okay. And this this cannot be zero. And all these are, these are constant quantities. So the only option that is left with us is that P1 B1 minus P2 B2. This is equal to zero. So that means when P1 B1 this is equal to P2 B2. So therefore the correct option is A. An isolated ideal gas is kept at pressure P1 and volume B1. The gas undergoes free expansion and attains a pressure P2 and volume B2. Identified the correct statement. So since we are given that it's an ideal gas which undergoes free expansion, so that means it will satisfy certain conditions. First, it is confined to certain volume B1. So let's take an example of a container which is divided into two equal parts volume V1 each. Okay, so here in this compartment we are having the ideal gas which is at pressure P1 and volume V1. Okay, so here gas molecules they are confined to this volume. Now, here is a vacuum. Okay, and this entire compartment it's isolated from the surrounding so that there is no energy loss to the surrounding when gas expands. Okay, now Suppose we are making a small hole here and allow the, this idle gas to expand okay, into this in the, this chamber also. Okay. And ultimately the pressure becomes P2 and volume becomes B2. Okay. So in this case the important points that we need to know, uh, note are so here delta Q it is equal to 0 because there is no interaction of this system with the surrounding okay so here this is this is our entire system both these compartment they constitute our system okay and outside is our surrounding okay so here since there is no energy exchange with the uh, between the system and surrounding so delta q is equal to 0 and also here delta w is also 0 Note here that although the gas is expanding from volume B1 to V2, but delta W is 0. And this is because this represents the external work. External work. Which is involved whenever a system has interaction with the surrounding. Okay, so here the situation is totally different. Therefore, external work is 0 here. So this conclude that delta U, which is equal to U final, minus u initial this is equal to 0 for idle case idle gas okay and because delta u is equal to 0 this also conclude that delta t which is equal to t final minus t initial this is equal to 0 so that means final and initial temperature of the gas they are same okay and because this is an idle gas so it is bound to satisfy the condition pv is equal to nrt because here during this process when the gas expands temperature stays fixed okay so when pressure changes to p2 and volume changes to v2 so this will always satisfy the relationship p1 v1 this is equal to p2 v2 okay now because delta q is 0 so this implies the process is also adiabatic adiabatic but remember that this is not reversible Process. This is an irreversible adiabatic process. Irreversible, irreversible adiabatic process. Okay. So therefore, correct options are option A and option B. 
Note that this this is not the correct one here because this relationship the PV equal to gamma constant holds for holds for a reversible process, not for irreversible. Reversible process. Let's continue with the next question. The statement is. A Carnot engine operates between two temperatures TL equal to 100 Kelvin and TH is equal to 150 Kelvin. Okay, so that means we are having a Carnot engine which is working between two reservoirs whose temperature is TH equal to 150 Kelvin and another reservoir whose temperature is TL which is given to be 100 Kelvin. Okay, then in between we are having a working substance that undergoes a cyclic process. Okay, and then and it's given that each cycle of the engine it lasts for 0.5 seconds. So that means when the working substance undergoes a cycle, so it takes only 0.5 seconds for one full cycle. Okay and during which the power delivered is 500 joule per second. So that means when the working substance undergoes a cycle so it, and it's given that in one second the energy output is 500 joule. So that means uh, we have to from this information we have to identify that how much work is delivered okay in, in half second. So because in one second in one second we obtain 500 joule. Okay, that, that, that's the amount of energy that is delivered. So that means in one and a half second, so that means in point five second, we will have 250 joule of work. So here the work will be work delivered per cycle that will be 250 joule. Okay, and then let QH be the corresponding heat absorbed by the engine and KL with the heat loss. So that means, so here the engine or the working substance it absorb KOH amount of heat from reservoir which is at temperature TH and at the same time it's given that KOL is the heat that is rejected to the reservoir at lower temperature. Okay, then we have to identify which one of the following four options they are correct. So with this information because the temperature of the source and sink they are given to us so we can work out the efficiency. So let's first of all uh, work out the that what is the efficiency of the heat engine. Okay. So if I denote the efficiency by eta this is equal to in terms of temperature 1 minus the temperature of the lower reservoir which is TL divided by temperature of the reservoir at higher temperature which is TH. So this is equal to 1 minus 100 divided by 150 okay so it will cancel so ultimately 2 here and 3 here so this will give you 1 by 3 so efficiency is 1 by 3 okay so let's call this as equation 1 also we can write the expression for the efficiency in terms of work eta that is the net work output okay divided by the input so input is qh here okay so divided by qh Okay, so from here we can calculate and this is equal to this is equal to 1 divided by 3. So from here we can calculate the value of QH. Okay, so this implies QH this is equal to 3 times W. So W is 3, uh, 250 Joule. Okay, so 3 multiply by 250. So that will give us KOH value of 750 Joule. Okay. So this is our second result. KOH we have obtained to be equal to 750. Okay. And from here we can calculate the value of the KOL also. So then we have another expression uh, for the efficiency of the engine in terms of the heat exchanges that are involved during this, uh, this uh, cyclic process. Okay, so eta, eta, this is equal to 1 minus QL upon QH. Okay, and 
this gives us uh, when we equate it to be equal to 0 and after solving this because QH we have already work, uh, worked out in the previous step so from here we can calculate QL so after so, uh, rearranging the quantities in this expression QL will be 2 by 3 multiplied by QH so which is equal to 2 by 3 into 750 okay and if you when you solve it this comes out to be 500 joule so this way we have determined both QH, QL and efficiencies okay let's call this as 3 okay now because the values of QH and QL they are known to us so from here we can evaluate the ratio between two different heats so QH by QL this is equal to 750 divided by 500 and this is equal to 2 by 3 and which is nothing but 1.5 and this is greater than 2 by 3 so this is our next result okay I'm calling this as result 4 okay now since uh, in the options that are given in the question the entropy changes are also uh, given there so let's uh, try to evaluate the entropy change for the heat engine so when we say the entropy change of the engine so that means we are talking about the entropy change for the bucking substance that undergoes a cycle so that means the entropy change entropy change of engine or we can say working substance substance okay in one cycle so one cycle is of half second so that mean in 0 0.5 second okay so let's call this as delta s engine okay and this is equal to q h divided by t h plus minus q l upon t l so note here we have added a we have uh, considered here a negative sign because q l is the amount of heat that is ejected by the working substance okay at temperature TL so that's why we, we, we are considering a, we are taking a negative sign here so when you plug in the values of these quantities we obtain this result to be equal to 750 divided by 150 plus minus 500 upon 100 and this comes out to be equal to 0 so that means the net entropy change for the bucking substance or you can say the the uh, the engine this is nothing but it's equal to 0 and this is in fact it's a qualitatively expected because it's a, uh, if it undergoes a reversible cyclic process then the entropy change uh, should be 0 now let's uh, evaluate the what is the entropy change of the hot bath okay the entropy change for hot bath hot bath so that mean we are talking about the reservoir which is at temperature th okay so when the process continues the hot bath it gives qh amount of heat to the the working substance so that means the corresponding entropy change for the hot bath will be delta s hot bath this is equal to negative sign because it's giving the heat QH to the working substance and at what temperature it is doing that it's doing that at temperature TH okay so this is equal to minus 750 divided by 150 okay and this is equal to minus 5 joule per Kelvin note here that the entropy change for the hot bath it is 5 joule, minus 5 joule per Kelvin same way if we evaluate the entropy change for the uh, lower uh, bath which is at lower temperature so delta s cold bath this is equal to q l upon 
TL. So here we are taking a negative, uh, positive sign here because now the cold bath it's gaining the energy QL from the working substance. Okay, so this will be equal to QL is 500 and TL is 100 and net entropy change is 5 joule per Kelvin for the cold bath. Okay, so let's try to see which, uh, which options matches with our calculations. Okay, let's go back. So, QH we have calculated to be equal to 750 Joule. So, that means this option is correct. Okay. And then we also evaluated the ratio of QH by QL and that's, that, that comes out to be larger than 2 by 3. So, this is incorrect. And then the third option is the change in entropy of the engine and the hot bath in a cycle is 5 Joule per Kelvin. Okay. So, we have calculated the entropy of the engine. It's 0. And entropy change of the hot bath, uh, it is minus 5 joule uh, per Kelvin. But when you add these two quantities, so that will give, give us the entropy change of the engine and entropy change for the hot bath. So if the net is delta S, which is a sum of these two quantities, okay. So delta S, delta S engine plus delta S hot bath. Okay, so then this quantity come out to be minus 5 joule per Kelvin. Okay, but the answer uh, that is written here, it's 5 joule per Kelvin. So therefore, it's not the correct option. And the fourth one is the change in entropy of the engine in 0.5 seconds. So that means in during one cycle, it's zero. Yes, this is also correct one. This is what we just evaluated. So let's continue with the next question. The statement is consider N1 number of idle gas particles enclosed in a volume V1. If the volume is changed to V2 and number of particle is reduced by half, the mean free path becomes four times of its initial value. Then what is the ratio B1 by B2? Okay, so here in this problem we have to find the ratio between two different volumes. So we know that the mean free path which we denote by lambda to first order approximation this is equal to 1 divided by under root 2 n sigma okay so here n is equal to number density that is number of gas molecules confined to certain volume b okay and sigma that is the cross section area which is equal to pi d square. So, here d this is the molecular diameter, molecule diameter. Okay. So, if we substitute the value of, if we replace small n with n by v, so with, with these two results, this result becomes equal to v divided by under root 2 n pi d square or in other words you can say that the mean free path lambda this is proportional to b divided by n when other parameters are constant okay or from here we can write that volume is proportional to n lambda okay so with this result we are going to solve this problem here so we are given that we are having n1 number of gas molecule initially n1 and they are confined in volume b1 okay and it's also given that volume it's changing from v1 to b2 okay and the number of gas molecules n1 it's changing to another value n2 which is equal to n1 by 2 it's becoming half okay and with this the mean free path changes to a new value which is equal to four times the initial value okay so then by using this result that volume that's proportional to n lambda so we can write for these two different situation v1 divided by v2 that is equal to the because 
we are having a constant of proportionality so a constant that will disappear when we will take the division so that is n1 and then lambda 1 so lambda 1 is here lambda okay so n1 lambda divided by n2 lambda 2 so n2 is n1 by 2 n1 by 2 and lambda 2 is how much it's 4 lambda multiply by 4 lambda okay so n1 lambda n1 lambda will cancel with each other so this this is equal to 1 by 2 or 0 0.5 so therefore the ratio b1 by b2 is 0 0.5 the statement is n ideal black body at temperature t emits radiation of energy density u okay the corresponding value for a material at temperature t by 2 is u by 256 its emissivity is how much so we are given the values for the black body and then we have to uh, find the emissivity of a given unknown body okay so we know that the energy density The energy density which we denote by small u okay this is e sigma t4 okay where e what is e that is the emissivity emissivity and sigma is the Stephen constant And T is the temperature of the body. Okay. T is the body temperature. Remember that for black body, E is equal to unity. Okay. So here, for the case of black body, we can write, let's say U1 denotes the energy density. So because E is equal to 1 for the black body, so U1 will become equal to sigma t ki power 4 ok let's say this is equation 1 here ok now for the given body if we denote the energy density by u2 ok u2 this is equal to now for the given body we have to determine the emissivity it's not known, known to us ok so emissivity will remain as it is emissivity e sigma and then t power 4 but now the the body temperature of the the uh, new unknown body it's t by 2 so here we will have a factor of t divided by 2 and its power 4 but also it's given that the energy density for the unknown body at this temperature this is u divided by 256 and this is equal to u divided by 256 let's call this as equation 2 now, by simply taking a ratio between these two, uh, these two expression, okay, so we can determine the value of the emissivity E here. So this is equal to U basically. Okay. Now, just take a ratio between these two quantities. That is, if you divide one with equation two, so that will give you. After solving it, you will obtain that sixteen is equal to one upon E. So, this implies the emissivity, this is equal to 1 by 16 or this is further equal to, after dividing it, 0 0.0625 or you can approximate it to be equal to 0 0.063. So, therefore, the right answer is up to 3 decimal places, it is 0 0.063.